when we think about open source, source is the fundamental element, you know, because source is, you know, there are four degrees of freedom. You can see it, you can change it, you can reuse it, you can redistribute it. Those degrees are well defined. When you think in terms of open source AI, you know, source is just one part of it. Hi, this is your host, Aptin Bhartia, and we are here at Open Source Summit in Seattle. Today, we have with us once again, Arun Gupta, Vice President and General Manager of Open Source Ecosystem at Intel. Arun, it's great to have you back on the show. Thank you for having me again. Yeah, it's my pleasure to host you. Uh, yesterday, there was a big announcement in terms of AI. Because quickly give us a summary and overview of what you folks announced yesterday. We announced uh, something called as an Open Platform for Enterprise AI, or OPIA. You know, this platform basically brings the ecosystem players together on, on how do you create your Gen AI solutions. And this needs to be done in an open ecosystem because we believe open ecosystem creates leveled playgrounds that allows multiple players, partners, developers to collaborate and compete together because it sets up an open standard. Then you can know what your rack pipelines look like. And then as part of that rack pipeline, if we all agree, yeah, there is vector databases required, there are chunkings required, you know, there is, you know, ingestion required, there is, you know, full security required, there is transparency required. Let people figure out what the components mean for them, what the actual implementations would look like. So yesterday we announced the initiative, OPIA, and there is a website, uh, opia.dev, where you can go find out it out. Uh, there is github.com slash opia-project, where we have created um, some samples where people can take a look at it. So essentially, as part of the effort, what we have is a conceptual framework which defines, like, what does it mean to have an open platform for enterprise AI? That's the conceptual framework, quote unquote, the specification. In addition to that, we have reference flows or examples that you can say, fine, you've got the concept, but how, do you, how does it work? So that's the construction part of the Gen AI. The second part of it is the evaluation part of it. Like, fine, I've I'm running this flow on an architecture because end of the day you go to deploy it into a production. Whether it's a Xeon or Gaudi combination or NVIDIA combination or ARM combination, it doesn't matter. End of the day, from a customer empathy perspective, you need to have that thing running on the flow. And you should be able to see that, what is my SLA? What is my TCO? You know, how, what is the security element? What is the trustworthiness element of it? What frameworks, what benchmarks are you using to giving me a unified framing, a ranking across all of these. So that's sort of what the effort is about. When it comes to Gen AI, LLMs, you know, what is open source there? Because it's, it's not as simple as the old days lamp stack, you know, for components you have every, uh, what are the challenges that you see when it comes to modern, because we have been using AI for ages, right? Right. But the, the, the AI we are talking about today is a bit different. So can you talk about the challenges when it comes to AI and open source? When we think about open source, source is the fundamental element, you know, because source is, you know, there are four degrees of freedom. You can see it, you can change it, you can reuse it, you can redistribute it. Those degrees are well defined. When you think in terms of open source AI, you know, source is just one part of it. There is a model, there is weights, there is data, there is infra on how have you created this? Because along with that, if there is no transparency in any of that, you don't know what is the ethical element of the model, what is the bias of the model, what is the transparency of the model, what is the attribution of the model, like, for example, we talk about Sora, which is a service that is announced by OpenAI. Now that produces videos. Where are these videos trained from? Like, you know, who is it attributed to? You know, and if I'm getting a video, similarly, if I'm using a text to code, for example, for a model, like when I'm getting the code back, where is this code trained on? Is this code trained on an OSI license? Is this code trained on a non-OSI license? So there are a significant amount of challenges and that's where uh, places like Open Source Initiative or OSI is really driving sort of towards the industry what that open source and AI definition should look like. And the understanding, the discussion is happening, it would probably on a range of a spectrum that are your, is your data available? Is your you know, uh, LLM available? Is it open AI? Is it open API? What it's going to be? So I think the discussion is still very much up in the air, but we really believe that open source LLMs 
are the ones that are going to be really a lot more trusted and a lot more deployable because then that gives you the ability to take, so for example, I could take you know, a Llama 2 model and run it on my laptop. Can I do that with the closed source models? I can. So I think that's the challenge, very typical way we see this, you know, what you want to do with the model. One more thing is that, as you said, you know, what are you training it on? And I was having a discussion yesterday, um, and one of the uh, concerns was also that when we look at, you know, a lot of more popular uh, LLMs, they're mostly trained on data, which is more catered to Western audience, you know. So the rest of the world, you know, so there will be a bias within Gen AI, and that bias is not because you purposefully introduce the bias, but the, the, the data you use to train, the models that you use to train it on. Uh, how much concern is that, not only from the perspective of LF, but also from Intel. Five years from now, we don't want to see that, hey, you know what, our Gen AI is totally biased again, you know, because if we are using that AI, strategies, wars, we don't know. And those biases can be dangerous. Those can be very dangerous, actually. And that's where I think open source shines in because open source brings that global diversity, global perspective, because now you can say that, hey, here is my LLM available, train it and feed it back to me. You know, I know exactly the kind of data it is trained upon. Then I can take that model, fine tune it for my vertical specific use case, because um, for example, if like, I remember a case study uh, with Penn that Intel did with Penn, and they were trying to figure out if we can figure out the cancer in the bone, right? And that case study was done originally as part of three cities in the US. And guess what? They wanted to deploy that model in India. And that didn't work. Of course it wouldn't work because the body, the physique, the structure, the density, the genes are very different over here. And taking that model, really taking it out you know, to different parts of the world, truly building a global model so that if you really want to serve a global audience, you read that global input. So data, I think, in the next few years is going to be the king, independent of whether it's an open source LLM or a closed source LLM. The biggest advantage of open source LLM is, is evident that what is the bias? What is the transparency? What is the ethics? You know, who's who defines the ethics in a closed source model? The, the walled garden in open source, you can say that, no, I don't agree with these ethical rules and let's work on this together on what that needs to look like. Since we are talking about ethical issues, uh, we cannot ignore the geopolitical world that we are living in, wars are going on. We don't know if situation will get better or worse, but it's kind of also leading to something else, which is kind of uh, techno-nationalism. Sometimes a lot of organizations, countries, they lean more towards open source because they do know that because of some political fallout, they will not be stripped from those technologies. So do you also see open source as a kind of becoming a global language for writing software, building software? It very well is actually. And just like LF, just like any multinational company, Intel has presence you know, in about 60 countries around the world. And we have colleagues all around the world and when we talk about open source innovation, that within Intel, that happens at multiple companies, multiple countries. And we are part of the same team. You know, we are talking that open source language that, hey, we want to contribute to PyTorch. That's the language we are talking about, independent of what the political tension between the two countries is. And that honestly to me still gives me goosebumps that how open source is a common language, common lingo. When I say I'm going to put a patch when I'm going to put a PR in PyTorch, a folk, a person in US versus in India versus in China versus in Europe, they all get the same language. That's the beauty. That's the collective power of open source. How does this further democratizes AI, Gen AI, makes it more accessible for not everybody can have massive data centers or massive servers there. So talk about that aspect, you know, for enterprise customers from a cloud native perspective. If you think about Gen AI solutions, that is right. You know, creating an LLM or even fine tuning an LLM requires massive compute resources. So one of the first efforts as part of this Gen AI solution is, how do we create those RAG pipelines, which is basically retrieval augmented generation. And RAG basically what it means is you take a LLM, doesn't matter whether it's an open source or a closed source LLM, you take an LLM, you contextualize it with your business data and you bring like a vector database into the position 
and then a vector database is your context is stored. And now you make a prompt to the LLM, but before going to the LLM, you contextualize it with the data from the vector database, and then the LLM returns the information back to you. So I think in that sense, defining that as a standard architecture, bringing a set of closed and open vendors so that we define that, okay, we agree upon this is a RAG architecture, and then it is modular, it is composable, it is pluggable, and uh, you can tell me that this is, you know, what level of uh, deployment it can do. All of that is exactly how it's going to democratize the Gen AI solutions, because the more we can agree upon on the baseline that, yeah, this is what the architecture is, okay, let's do more fun things on top of that. What does open source or cloud native AI or Gen AI looks like? Or are we close to building it? Or is this project a step towards that? No, actually, um, if you think about it, <clears throat> what we are defining in this uh, OPIA project essentially is a set of microservices, right? Because the, when we talk about the ecosystem complexity and the technical complexity is massive. And for an enterprise that is an end user, that is not a creator of a technology, it's just mind boggling. And how do I'm going to deploy these solutions, right? So that's where the OPIA project is going to kick in. It's going to come in that, okay, you know what? You want to deploy Gen AI solutions. We believe this is architecture you should take. Take a look at the industry momentum behind this. We have several partners that were part of the announcements that was as part of the uh, Linux Foundation press release. This is the way we're seeing the industry momentum. You can deploy it on a hardware of your choice or a CSP or whatever it works. And these microservices, end of the day, is very su not surprising at all, actually. They are deployed on a cloud-native platform. And so essentially, you take these microservices, you package them in a container, and Kubernetes has become the de facto compute platform. So that's where these services scale. So essentially, over the last 10 years, so many enterprises have invested into cloud native platform. So it's literally going to build on top of that, that no matter what is a vector database you're using, no matter what is your embedding, chunking, um, retrieval is going to be, you know, your prompt engineering is going to be, but all of that are simple microservices that are really working with each other on a cloud native platform. Give us a quick summary overview of the organizational structure of OPIA. So OPIA is part of the LFAI and Data Foundation because when we looked at different foundations, we realized LFAI and Data Foundation is the right place to put it because the cohesion of the projects that is within the LFAI and Data is the best. Uh, so that's definitely the place where it belongs and it, that, with that it brings neutral governance even though Intel has contributed the initial set of code. But end of the day, it's about under LFAI and Data copyright governance and as part of that uh, project, we're going to define a technical steering committee of which Intel is going to be only one member. But then rest all are going to be around the partners because end of the day, we want those partners to feel, you know, we want to give them a responsibility and an authority to drive the project forward. So I think that's sort of the way we are thinking about it. Neutral, third-party governance, where all of us collaborate together with the LFAI and Data Foundation. Now, it's sitting in LFAI and Data, but is going to collaborate very closely with CNCF, for example, because whatever experiences we gain out of this, deploying this on a cloud native platform, we're going to feed it back to the CNCF. And I happen to be the CNCF governing board chair as well, so I know a few people over there. Particularly around the, there's a cloud native AI ML working group. So that's the working group that we're going to work very closely to feed the input and take input from them. Similarly, we're also going to work with OpenSSF. Now, if we're going to make this OPIA platform, well, not if, we're going to make this OPIA platform secure, and that's exactly where OpenSSF kind of fits in, that how do we make this platform secure? Then if we're going to generate, when we're going to generate S-bombs around it, then we're going to work with the other working groups within LF. So I think LF is really the place where all the action is happening, but by no means we're going to restrict ourselves to LF. We're going to work with other foundations. So for example, I was having discussion with uh, Rebecca Rumble, you know, who leads Rust Foundation, and she got excited about it. And similarly, we're going to talk to other foundations. So even though LF is the primary home, but as LF's philosophy has been, we're going to work with other foundations to make this work for everybody. Can you also talk from the view of uh, when we look at OPR, uh, what is the code or what kind of release plan you folks have for it? Yeah, so at this point, really, we're not looking at bringing new components in there. It's more about how do we compose the components, existing components, because there is already a lot of innovation that is happening. So the first set of uh, work that we are going to do is really create those 
Gen AI examples, which are the reference flows, blueprints that people can start deploying over there. And then we're going to start working on setting up the TSC. There is a meetup that is coming up on May 15th in Portland. So we're going to encourage folks to join us over there. We're going to host meetups in the Bay Area. And you know, leading up to Intel innovation is sort of how we're going to build the timeline. Um, in the next few weeks, we are planning to set up the uh, technical steering committee. And that's sort of the direction. And then eventually, when the technical steering committee is set up, it's going to be their prerogative on what they want to accomplish out of this. But Intel will continue to provide the support, engineering support, whatever experience, whatever customer use cases that we have, we're going to bring it to Opia. Talk a bit about, you know, of course, Gen AI or AI from cloud native perspective to enable the, I mean, we can look at both ways, you know, right. cloud native enabling yeah. or Gen AI enabling cloud native. It's both, no, yes. absolutely, you know. And it's very important that we see it both ways. That how is cloud native enabling Gen AI and how is Gen AI using cloud native both ways, right? So let me talk from the other perspective where what is the work that is happening in the cloud native community to enable workloads? So for the last year, year and a half, there is an AI ML working group which is actively working on defining how do we enable AI workloads in Kubernetes. Last year, October, um, I ran a TED AI hackathon and this was all about you know, using AI to solve problems related to UN Sustainable Development Goals. And when we were, when the presenters were presenting like their solutions and we asked them that what are you using to deploy this on? Their, their response was Kubernetes. I think, oh, that's cool. So the AI developers, they understand the value premise of Kubernetes and Kubernetes is sort of the de facto platform over there. And if you saw the keynote in KubeCon Paris, is basically taking all the work that is happening in AI and putting that into production. There's a lot of work happening around uh, dynamic resource allocation that you don't need the entire GPU for training or inference. You know, how do you timeshare that GPU? How can we improve the telemetry you know, so that the AI models can improve the transparency up there to the developers? So there's a lot of exciting stuff happening in the cloud native space to enable the AI workloads. If there are gaps and opportunities, we would love to hear. Arun, once again, thank you so much for taking time out today to talk about OPIA. And also in general, I love the whole discussion around open source, AI, Gen AI, and cloud native AI, Gen AI. Thanks for all those great insights. And as usual, I would love to chat with you again. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Bye-bye.